Welcome everyone at the GRN webinar for April. Our webinar today will focus on Creative Commons Basics and is brought to you by GRN in collaboration with Global Book Alliance and All Children Reading. The webinar is intended to support ministries of education as they collaborate to provide open elegant reading resources. And today's webinar will provide information on open education resources movement and open licensing options, including the benefits of open education materials and opportunities and restrictions different licenses offer to open education resource stakeholders, and in this case, uh, ministries of education. Today, we are targeting ministers of education in Africa region, and we have three presenters for this webinar. The first one is Cable Green, who is the main speaker for this webinar. Jennifer Guest, who will provide an overview of GRN, and Linda Hubbard, who will give an opening remarks. Cable Green works with the global open education community to leverage open licensing content, practices, and policies to significantly improve access to quality, affordable education and richer and research resources so that everyone in the world can attain all education they desire. Cable Green's career is dedicated to raising access to education opportunities for everyone around the world. He is leading advocate for open licensing and procurement policies that ensure publicly funded education materials are freely and openly available to the public that paid for them. Cable Green has 20 years of academic technology online learning and open education experience and how to establish open course library, open policy network, open education resources policy registry, creative commons certificate, creative commons open education platform and other projects. Cable Green holds uh, a PhD in education psychology from Ohio State University and he enjoys motorcycling and playing in the mountains with his family. He lives in Washington State with his wife and two boys. Welcome, Cable. Jennifer Guest, another, another speaker for today's webinar is Jennifer Guest, who is the project director of Reading Within, within, of reading within Reach and the Global Reading Network. Welcome, Jennifer. And uh, our third speaker will be Linda Hubbard, who is a senior advisor of the Global Book Alliance. My name is Aristarik Limo from Reading Within Reach. I'll be moderating this webinar. I would like to welcome uh, all the speakers and participants to this webinar, and I hope you will enjoy the webinar. For all participants, if we have a technology question, you will need to type it in the chat box and we'll address it as soon as possible. If it is a question uh, to the speakers, type them in the question and answers box. We will gather them and address them in the mid and at the end of the presentation. Welcome and enjoy the webinar. And now I welcome Jennifer uh, to provide an overview of CRIN. Jennifer, you're welcome. Sure. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, I'm the project director for Global Reading Network. And uh, what we do is manage the community of practice, focus on USAID's goal of improving uh, reading in the early grades around the world. Um, we have quite a dynamic network and, and have um, had a really, really wonderful including the Global Book Alliance um, on concerns to us with respect to um, ensuring access to books. Um, and as we know, um, access to books um, to support children in their early grades um, is limited. Um, and um, one of the latest policies of USAID uh, they came out with a few years ago was to encourage an open educational resource policy and to encourage the open licensing of books. Um, because as we know, um, copyrights on books and or on reading resources really limit how they can be shared um, and ultimately limit the impact, reach, and scalability of the materials. Um, but we decided to develop this series of webinars because as we explored this issue with various missions and implementers working on reading, we realized there were some 
may, may be some limited understanding about the types of opportunities there are with open licenses in terms of just res uh, respecting the copyright, the original copyright holder, and protecting those works. And we thought it would be a good, uh, it would be good to start our our series with Cable Green, who can give us more information about um, how open license, what types of open licenses are out there. I do want to let you know uh, that after this webinar, we will do another webinar where we would like to connect with publishers who are looking at models to, um, a business model to support open access to their works. And as well, we'll be developing guidance a little bit that will be available a little bit later this summer to implementers to uh, help them manage this, this cycle with their colleagues at Missions and Ministries of Education in terms of preparing materials to be open licensed. So um, I'm gonna pass it over to Linda Hubert who can tell us a little bit about the Global Book Alliance's strategy and the, the relevance of open licensing to their objectives. Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, thank you everyone who's on this call, it's really a delight to be able to give you a bit of information about the Global Book Alliance. Um, as you may know, our vision really is to provide uh, literacy and materials to children uh, in languages that are underserved across the entire globe. And we want every child to be able to have access to reading materials and textbooks. Um, we know that uh, from research, that books are one of the main uh, ways in which children learn to read so that they can then read to learn. And so this is a, this is a really important area uh, for all of us to be ha helping to uh, help children to achieve that, that literacy that's so important for their future. The Global Book Alliance is uh, working across the entire book chain. So we are looking at the development of titles, we're looking at the procurement of titles, uh, access to titles, as well as uh, supply chain management and distribution, and then finally the use of those materials both in school and in communities. Uh, one of the key ways in which we want to be able to help children is through access. And we know that if we have titles that are open, uh, licensed, it is much easier for uh, schools and governments and even publishers to be able to access those books in order for children to then have access to them as well. So we are delighted to be here um, at the this first webinar and to uh, be able to uh, tell you a bit about the Global Book Alliance. We'd be more than happy to have other uh, uh, ways in which we can have uh, connection with you if if you would like to know more about the Global Book Alliance. I'm now gonna pass it back over to Limo. Thank you, Jennifer, for an overview, and Linda for providing opening remarks. I now pass it to Cable Green to take us through what he has prepared for us today on Creative Commons Basics. Well, uh, hello everybody. My name is Cable Green. I'm the Director of Open Education at Creative Commons. That essentially means I run all of our education programs. I've been at Creative Commons now for just over eight years. And so uh, I uh, probably have questions, or probably have answers to your questions, and we will make time for questions throughout the program. Uh, if you want to uh, contact me, there's my Twitter account there, uh, and or you can contact me on email at cable at creativecommons.org. Uh, today we're gonna talk about a couple things, uh, open licensing, open education, and we'll get into uh, talking about open policy as well. Uh, of course, all of these slides are openly licensed. They're all under a CC BY license. Uh, and so don't worry about taking notes. The organizers have a copy of the slides and I've invited them to please make them available to all of you. So before we get into the details, I always like to start with, why are we having this conversation? Uh, why does the Global Book Alliance, why does USAID care about open licensing of the reading materials uh, that they're creating and that you all are creating. And fundamentally what we're talking about is this, is that education is about sharing. We wanna make sure that everybody in the world, uh, you know, as we look at SDG4, has an opportunity to not only access quality learning materials, but to uh, access quality learning environments. <clears throat> 
Now, we've got this amazing set of tools today as educators. We have the internet, we have digital, where we can make perfect copies of educational resources, uh, millions or billions of perfect copies uh, at, uh, very quickly and at low cost. We can use the internet to move those perfect copies around the web. Uh, we can print them, we can take them offline. Um, but all of those wonderful things we can do with the technology, copyright forbids. Copyright, all rights reserved copyright says, you may not make a copy without my permission. You may not redistribute or perform the work without my permission. Now, I'm not here to, uh, to bash copyright today. Copyright is an important law. It serves a very important purpose. Um, but when we're thinking about education, uh, we want to ask ourselves, are we fully leveraging the suite of tools, both technological and legal, to make sure that everybody in the world uh, has an opportunity to learn? Uh, there's oftentimes confusion between open and free. People say, well, I found it on the web, or I have a copy of it here on this DVD drive. Uh, it's freely available to me. And that may be true, but it may not be open. So we say open's not the same as free, because things that are free can sometimes be uh, precarious, meaning uh, somebody can take them off the web, or somebody can take the copy away from you. They might be rigid, and by that I mean uh, you may not have an editable file format that you can modify to meet your local needs. So open is not those things. When we're talking about open, we're specifically talking about the permissions that everyone ha has to legally do things with that educational resource. And specifically, we're talking about these permissions, the legal rights to retain. These are called the five R's. So you can legally retain a copy. Uh, you can keep it forever. No one can take it away from you. You can reuse the work. So I can download a copy of the work and reuse it exactly the way it was produced. I can revise the work. So maybe, uh, maybe it was produced in French, uh, but I need it in um, Bahasa Indonesian. And so to revise, modify, translate that work is going to be very important for my learning environment with my students. I can remix the work. So I can take a book from the Global Digital Library, and a book from the Africa Storybook Project, and I can remix them together into something new that's gonna meet the needs of my learners. And then I can redistribute. I can take that modified thing that I created and I can share that out with the world. So these are all things that traditional all rights reserved copyright would say you can't do without permission, but when we openly license an educational resource, we're giving the public the permissions to do these activities. So we talked a bit about the technology how things being digital is really important, how the internet is really important, the ability to take digital works offline uh, for communities where there's still major digital divide issues. All those technologies are really critical. The legal part of this is important as well. And this is where I work at Creative Commons. We're a nonprofit organization, we're global. We create uh, and have since 2001, we create the standard open copyright licenses that the world uses to share copyrighted resources. Our licenses work everywhere. They respect copyright. They sit on top of copyright. Uh, and we have teams of, we call them country chapters, in 38 countries around the world, and that's growing by about two countries per month. So what is Creative Commons uh, licenses? Why do they exist? They exist for this reason, that on the one extreme we have all rights reserved copyright, on the other extreme we have public domain where there is no copyright. For works to get from all rights reserved copyright into the public domain depends on what country you're in. For the most part, the author or the creator of the work has to die, and then 70 to 100 years have to pass after the author's death before the work goes into the public domain. And so if I want to share my educational psychology textbook with you on Tuesday, that doesn't work very well because first I have to die and then 70 years have to go by and then you can have it in the public domain. So there was really no in between. And so Creative Commons came along and said, well, what would it look like if you, the creator, the author, the grantee, kept your copyright on your work, you kept the ownership of the work and you added a license to it, an open license, so that the public had a certain set of freedoms and permissions that they could use right away. That's what Creative Commons licenses are for. <laughs> Keep your copyright, add an open license to the work. 
CC licenses have six different, uh, sorry, uh, four different conditions. Uh, the first one is called attribution. This is when somebody uses your work, they must give you credit or they must attribute the work. Uh, this is on all of our licenses. It's not optional. We believe very firmly that if uh, what you're doing when you put a CC license on your work is you're giving a gift to the world. Uh, in this case, you're giving educational resources uh, to the world and you're making those uh, available. The, uh, the second condition, the, the next three conditions are optional. The first one is called share alike. Share alike means if I use your work and you've put a share alike license on it and I modify your work, I have to share my modified work forward under the same license. Non-commercial is what it sounds like. Non-commercial is you may not use my work for commercial purposes. No derivatives means you can't change my work. When you mix and match these different conditions together, you get one of six Creative Commons open licenses. You may have seen these around the web. When we're talking about education, we line these licenses up in a very particular way. Uh, and in addition to the six licenses at the top here, you can see we also have a tool called the CC0 public domain dedication, where if you want to give up your copyright today and dedicate your work to the public domain, we have a tool that allows you to do that. So when we're thinking about educational use of openly licensed resources, one of our goals is always to give to other educators as much freedom, as many degrees of freedom, as much flexibility as we possibly can. We don't want to say to that teacher in Indonesia, oh, I'm sorry, you can't uh, translate the work into local languages for your students. That's what the no derivatives license actually does. It says no changes at all. So two of our licenses, the two no derivatives licenses, really don't work well at all for education. So that's why it says not open educational resources at the bottom of the slide. Is that the world collectively, the open education movement around the world has decided that those just don't meet the needs of educators. The other licenses and the public domain dedication uh, do meet that five R's definition where you've got the, the freedoms and permissions to do what you want. So we proudly say that we put the open in open educational resources. There are a lot of Creative Commons licenses floating around the web and around the world. Um, this is a very conservative number as of last year. The number is climbing at somewhere between two and 300 million additional CC licenses every year. We run something called the State of the Commons Report, which keeps track of that. What's important here is that CC licenses are perpetual irrevocable permissions. So perpetual means they last forever. So you put a CC license on a work, that work is available to the public until the copyright expires on the work and the work goes into the public domain. They're also irrevocable, meaning that once there's a CC license on the work, that license cannot be removed. You can't take those permissions back away from the public. That's really important because if I'm a teacher in, in Berlin and I've put together my course, if somebody's able to reach into my course or reach into my early childhood reading materials and rip out some of the materials that were previously openly licensed, that would leave a big hole in my educational resources. CC licenses don't let people do that. CC licenses say once you've got access, you've got access forever. So I've been throwing around this term open educational resources. Let me be specific. Uh, when we're talking about OE, uh, educational resources, we mean all of the different materials that you use in an educational setting uh, to work with students so that they can learn. It can be textbooks, syllabi, lesson plans, all this stuff that we use. When we're talking about open educational resources, we mean something very specific. We mean all that stuff you use, the teaching, learning, research materials, in any medium. So OER certainly can be online and digital. It doesn't have to be. There are huge projects around the world, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the OER is actually offline, where those digital files have been taken offline, and there are some wonderful projects that, that work in that space, Calibri and others. These works have to have the legal permissions that let you modify them and change them to meet your needs. So they either have to be in the public domain or they have to be released under an open license that permits no cost access, use and adaptation and redistribution. So you've got to have those five R's permissions for something to be an open educational resource. So just to recap, and then we're going to go to some questions here in a minute. 
when we use traditionally copyrighted, all rights reserved copyrighted materials, what the internet enables, what Creative Commons enables, copyright forbids. It says, no, you can't modify it. No, you can't make a million copies of it. No, you can't share it with people, with students around the world. When we choose open educational resources or when we put an open license on something, what the internet enables, what the CC legal tools enable, open permits. Why do we care about this? We care about this because this is a major access issue. This is, a, uh, this is just one of many studies uh, that came out in the US that said two thirds of students are not buying uh, textbooks because of costs. Um, half of them understand this is going to harm and do damage to their educational experience. And that uh, over 80% said, look, I would do a lot better in my course if I actually had the reading materials that were assigned to me by my teacher. Not a big surprise. Uh, this is about increasing equity. It's about increasing equality for everybody. When we are using open educational resources, all students have access to high quality materials on day one of their learning experience. The materials can be made up to date. They can be made relevant because the local educators can modify the educational, the openly licensed resources to meet local needs. And of course, as we've said, they can be freely copied, modified, and distributed to anyone. This is another example of a big OER project. This is called OpenStax. You can see uh, all of these different open textbooks they have. They all have a Creative Commons attribution license on them. They are all free. You can see the statistics here of how broad the use is. And then at the bottom of the screen, how much money uh, this has saved uh, students around the world. This started out really as a US project. They've branched into Australia and then the United Kingdom, and now these books are being used all over the planet. Uh, since 2012, it's saved students uh, closing in now on 600 US million dollars. Um, in primary and secondary education, there's uh, amazing projects around the world from the Global Digital Library to Book Dash, Africa Storybook. Um, here's one in my country in the United States called Open Up Resources. Not only are these resources all under a CC BY license, they're all freely available. They're building out math and science materials like they're doing in South Africa at the Siavula project. Um, what's interesting about this project is they're actually not only free and openly licensed, they also happen to be the best. So there's a group, a third party reviewer called Ed Reports in the United States, which reviews all of the primary and secondary curriculum um, that is uh, aligned with the standards, the common core standards in this country. And they reviewed all the commercial publishers and the OER and found that the OER was actually the highest quality content. So there's oftentimes a misperception that, well, if it's free, it must be garbage. Not true. Um, there are also uh, big projects all around the world where they're not just licensing a book openly or just a course. They're licensing entire degree programs. These are often called Z degrees or zero textbook cost degree programs. So this, is, this idea of OER has really taken off to all levels of education. And if we think about the types of materials we use in educational institutions, it usually looks like this. It's a mix of uh, commercial materials, library resources, and open educational resources. But what I want to highlight here is that there's a cost to students uh, that's different in these different types of resources. And then the legal permissions that both teachers and students have is very different depending on which resource you're using as well. Let me pause there, turn it back over to our moderators for a minute. Uh, I'll stop sharing and we'll uh, take a few questions. Thank you, Jabo Green, for sharing that wonderful knowledge on open licensing. And now we are breaking for five minutes to receive and answer your questions uh, on, the, on the section which Cabo Green has presented. After this five minutes, Cabo Green will continue with the presentation. Kevo Green, can you take the questions from the question and answer box? Or we should read them for you. No, that's fine. I've got them here in my chat window. Let's see, uh, somebody says, where do you post your work with the CC license marking? In other words, how do I best let people know my work is available? That's a great question. So um, that's kind of a two-part question. Uh, let me share a link with you. Uh, so the first question is really about marking. And so how do I mark my work with a CC license? I'm going to share a link. 
we actually have a page called Marking. <laughs> and uh, you can either mark your work with a CC license, or you can give attribution to someone else's work. And if you look at that uh, wiki page that we have, we have both of those scenarios laid out. Essentially, there's three easy ways to add a CC license to your work. I, I should say this is all free. There's no cost and never will be for adding a CC license. In fact, we've dedicated all of our licenses to the public domain using our public domain dedication. So they will always be free. Um, you can uh, just type the license on. This is under a Creative Commons attribution license, and that's fine, uh, and, and link to the license deed. Um, there are many platforms um, that are out there, technical platforms that where the CC licensing is integrated, where you can just write on the platform, add the license. So for example, when you upload a video to YouTube, you can either choose the standard YouTube license or the CC BY license. Um, uh, and there's, or there's, uh, sometimes people create templates for their projects and just add the license in the footer. So if you have a question about how to add a CC license to your project, feel free to always reach out to me. I'm happy to help you do that. As far as where do you post these, the answer is really um, post them in a way that the public can find them and that the audience that you're trying to reach can find them. So oftentimes, uh, funders, part of what we're talking about here is that USAID uh, has a, a Creative Commons attribution license requirement for the early childhood reading materials that they fund. Uh, the Global Book Alliance, Global Digital Library, others um, also work with open licensing. Um, and so, you know, part of what funders sometimes do is say, you, the grantees, uh, please submit the openly licensed works to us, and we're going to advertise those on a, uh, on a website. Um, sometimes the grantees simply put it up on their public website. Uh, sometimes you might want to put the resources also in an OER repository. So there are big databases around the world where people collectively share the open educational resources that they're, that they're creating. So those are all answers, and you don't have to put your materials just in one place. Obviously, you're the copyright holder. You can put them wherever you want. Okay, uh, somebody else, we'll see if there are any other questions. I don't see any other questions. If you have any, feel um, free to type them in. Table, there, there is one that came in that says, um, what about YouTube? Is the default license open? Can you choose an alternative, and what's the process? Yeah, good question. So um, YouTube, as I mentioned, has two license options. They have a standard YouTube license, and they have the Creative Commons attribution license. Um, when you upload your video, they give you a choice. In a, there's a pull-down menu about which license you want to choose. The default is the standard YouTube license. However, you can go into your settings for your YouTube account, and you can tell YouTube from now on when I upload uh, any video, I want the default to be a CC BY license. That's something that's quite common among platforms. If you upload your images to Flickr, you can, in your settings, tell Flickr anytime I upload uh, an image, I want it to be under a, a BY SA license or an attribution share of like license, or whatever license you choose. As the copyright holder, it's your choice uh, which license you want to put on your work. And you can put different CC licenses on different works. The exception to that, of course, I don't want to cause confusion in this webinar, is that if you have a funder, so let's use USAID as an example, and if that funder has required a particular license, as they have with their early childhood reading materials, then as the grantee, you need to use the license that the, that the funder required. Any other questions? Um, so a follow-up question to that was, can you take a YouTube video and put it onto a different platform? Yeah, so YouTube's uh, a little funny this way. YouTube's terms of service don't allow you to download videos from the YouTube platform. Of course, people do it all the time, but it does violate the YouTube terms of service. One of the things that Creative Commons does is we work with platforms, including YouTube, to say, look, you want to fix your terms of service so that they don't, they're not in conflict with what the license allows. Because, of course, the CC BY license would allow you to make a copy and put it somewhere else. Um, YouTube, in this case owned by Google, um, has not yet changed their terms of service. And so there's a bit of a conflict there right now. That being said, um, if you do find a video that has a CC BY license on it on YouTube, you could, uh, you know, 
reasonably follow the terms of the license, which would include uh, making a copy of it, translating it, modifying it to meet your needs. Um, there's one more question in the chat window. Okay, I see it from Mark. He says, uh, the challenge with US government funding under contracts is the rights in data clause, restrict, restricting copyright and works created requiring approval. Is my understanding that, that we might have a requirement to CC license the work created or procured under the USG contract? Only the copyright holder can do that. Therefore, the funder has to give us permission to copyright first. So, um, so Mark, I'm not um, qualified, nor should I get into the details of the contract. My advice there would be to reach out to your, uh, your USG program officer that you're working with and get into the details. Um, what I can say is that uh, you are correct that only the copyright holder can put an open license on a work. So you have to, you have to own the copyright to put the CC BY license on the work. Um, if, uh, so let's just run a scenario here really quick. If a U.S. government agency uh, retained copyright for themselves and the grantee was work for hire the, and the copyright sat with the U.S. government agency, then it would be the U.S. government agency which would put the CC BY license on the work. Um, it is quite common though, I, I, I've worked with many U.S. government agencies and other countries around the world, it's, it's, it's a very common practice that the grantee receives the copyright to the work that's created with grant funds and that it's the grantee that adds the Creative Commons license to the work. But you're absolutely right that what matters in the end is what does the contract say about who holds copyright and what's the open license requirement. Uh, looks like there's another question from Elizabeth. Uh, I have met some content creators who openly license the materials but still require special permissions to take it from their learning management system, which is interesting because they are open advocates but only for content, but only for content but not for website user experience. Have you seen similar challenges? So yes, Elizabeth, that's a, a really good point. You can legally take an openly licensed work and essentially put it behind a a paywall or a password protected space. There's nothing illegal about that. There's no violation of the license. It certainly, I would say, violates the intent of open educational resources and the intent is that everybody has access to it. Um, it is also true that sometimes uh, people will make a copy of the openly licensed work inside the learning management system and then bring it outside of the learning management system. And that doesn't violate the CC license. The license allows that it may violate a different agreement that you have uh, with the institution about their learning management system. So these are all things to take into account. I think it brings up a, a really important bigger point though, which is that at the start of any project where content will be produced, and this goes back to Mark's point as well, you want to, before anything is created, before any contract is signed, before any money changes hands for the project, you want to decide two big important things. One, who's going to hold the copyright to works that are created. Uh, two, along with that, uh, what's the open license requirement on those works. And three, where are we going to put this stuff so that people can get access to it. And it's really important that all of the parties have that conversation in advance of the project starting, and that way there's no confusion down the, down the road. Okay, I can see there's another one here. Uh, does the U.S. government have copyright to materials funded by USAID? If you've answered, I apologize for joining late, uh, from Liberia. So typically what the U.S. government does, and again, I'm not speaking for any one agency, but it's quite common uh, that the U.S. government agencies, they have a standard, what they call a government license. So in their boilerplate contract language, the, gov the U.S. government retains for itself what they call a non-exclusive worldwide perpetual license, basically to do with grantees work whatever they want to do with it in perpetuity. So they retain essentially a full set of copyright for themselves. And then, not always, but typically, the grantee also receives a non-exclusive copyright and the grantee adds the open license to the work. That's the general answer. If you have specific questions, you should talk with your, your program officer. 
Mark says, it's my understanding the U.S. government cannot claim original copyright, but can be assigned copyright and by the terms of the contract require that the contractor copyright assigned to the USG, though possible, I haven't experienced that yet. So again, again, Mark, I would talk with your program officer um, on that. Uh, the general rule of thumb is that the funder, whether it's a government, uh, state, federal, provincial, local, or a foundation, it, the funder makes the rules. So the in most countries, when, when money is given for a product to be produced, unless stated otherwise, the copyright sits with the funder. So if copyright's gonna be transferred, or at least not exclusive or copyright provided, that's written in the contract. Okay, somebody else says, uh, my question relates to illustrations. Pixabay done, has done a good job on checking that the, the images they have in their collection are in the public domain under CC0. However, works, however, works in the public domain do not list artists' names. No attribution required makes things easy, but may, may not show proper respect. So that's a, this is an excellent point. Um, yes, you can use CC0 to give up your copyright, put works in the public domain, but again, uh, respect is key here. And w what we talk about at Creative Commons all the time is showing gratitude. And when somebody is kind enough to put their work into the public domain, one of the ways that we can all show gratitude, even though it's not legally required, is to still give attribution. In the academy, in education, this is something that comes naturally to us because when we use somebody else's work, whether it's in the public domain or it's under copyright and openly licensed or under all rights reserved copyright, we cite the work, we give attribution. And that is, it's, it, you know, and if we don't, it's called plagiarism and that's a real problem in the academy. So yes, um, you, even if something is in the public domain, you need to provide attribution. Aside, uh, Kay says, aside from marking the materials with a CC license, do we need to register the work in a CC database to make it official? Good question. The answer is no. Uh, so let me share another link with you very quickly. This is uh, another way that you can get a CC license. It's called the CC license chooser. And so in the case of USAID early childhood reading grantees, the license has already been decided for you. They've decided to, uh, to that your works will be licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license or the CC BY license. That is the default license on the CC license chooser. Um, and then what you can do is go down, fill in a little bit of metadata, and it gives you the information for the license. Now you can either copy and paste the, the, the license information and paste it on your work, or, if you're dealing with a web page or something else that can take that machine readable code, there's a little bit of embed code, but if you put it on a blog or on a web page, it will actually render the license and your metadata and make it really easy for people to give you attribution. But no, there is no, there's no master database. The moment that you say this work is under a CC BY license, the world may use it under those terms. All right, looks like uh, last question, then we'll jump back to the slides and then we'll have another, another round of Q&A as well. Uh, somebody says, it looks like USAID Senegal, can reading uh, material created by a private, uh, by private edition under contract, then material transferred to the government, can editors then claim anything? Um, so, I, again, talk with your local USAID program officer about the specifics of the question. Um, Generally speaking, ownership is uh, made clear at the start of the grant, who holds the copyright. And so as far as uh, ownership being transferred, that's not something that typically occurs. Uh, ownership is determined up front about who owns it and what the open license requirement is to share those materials. Uh, okay, I'll take this last question and then we're gonna run back to the slides. Uh, somebody says the Ministry of Education has requested for copyright of materials we have uploaded to Creative Commons. Uh, they want to distribute the materials to public schools and to private schools at a cost. So uh, the good, so, so first of all, it's between the funder, could be USAID, and you, the grantee, about who holds the copyright. Um, that's probably either the funder or it's the grantee. Whether or not either of those parties wants to transfer copyright to the Ministry of Education, is a different decision altogether. The more important point here is that the Ministry of Education does not need the copyright to do what they want to do. Uh, once there's a CC BY license on the work, 
They have all the rights that they need to make a copy, distribute the materials, modify the materials, and even charge for uh, you know, printed copies of the materials because the CC BY license has no commercial restrictions on it. These are really great questions. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we are, uh, oh, wait, one more. I saw that came in. Megan says, I'm interested in a def detailed definition of non-commercial. Let's say somebody in Tanzania finds a book uh, they think their community would love and prints it, and they sell copies for the cost of materials. Would that violate the NC license? Uh, so, so first, important to remind us all, if you're, if you're taking grant money from USAID, you can't use the non-commercial uh, license. It's the CC BY license that you can use. So there is no non-commercial restriction on it uh, for the early childhood reading grants. That's the first important point. To answer your question, um, if, uh, now I, I say this saying this has not been tested in a court of law. CC licenses are tested in courts all the time. They've never once lost. Um, but what it looks like, there are actually two pending cases in the United States right now around non-commercial. And it's around a similar scenario to what you just laid out. Can you print uh, the materials? And it looks like the answer is yes, you can. So you can print the non-commercial materials, especially if you're printing them at cost and not for a profit. That, that is something that's been done for the past 15 years in the open education space in schools, colleges, and universities around the world. And it doesn't seem to bother anybody. Um, and including the people who put an NC license on their works. Uh, is it a bad idea to, uh, to license non-commercial use only? Is it no longer an OER? Uh, NC or non-commercial license works, um, uh, like a buy NC license is still OER. You still have five R's permissions. Does it cause additional friction uh, in the use of uh, an OER? Yes, it does. It, it tends to cause confusion. People say, oh, well, you know, I teach at a, uh, I teach at a, a religious uh, primary school in Uganda, and we charge tuition, and that's a commercial activity. Therefore, I can't use non-commercial OER in my classrooms. Now, that's not true. They just can't sell access to the OER. But that confusion is going to cause less use than, say, a CC BY work would have had. Great questions, everybody. Uh, get your next round ready. And uh, we've got just a few slides to wrap up. And then we'll come back to questions. So let me go ahead and share these. OK. So um, we've already talked a bit about this, but the, the idea behind what USAID and other funders are doing when they require openly license, open licenses on grant-funded works is this, is that publicly funded resources should be openly licensed by default. The rationale here is, is several fold. One is that the public should have access to what the public paid for. If I walk into a restaurant and I order lunch and I get charged five times for the lunch that I just ordered, I'm going to be very upset. When I pay for something, I expect to get access to it. So I happen to be a taxpayer in the United States. I pay taxes, federal taxes. I pay state taxes. When something is produced with that tax money that I paid for, I expect that I can get a copy of it. So governments around the world are starting to, to do that. They're requiring openly li open licenses. Uh, and this is not just governments. We're seeing this at all levels of government. Uh, foundations are moving this way. Uh, we're seeing uh, that what they're all doing is they're putting these open license requirements on grants and contracts that they're giving out. Uh, we've already talked about this, USAID in their, uh, in their education program, specifically with their early childhood reading grants for several years now, have required that their grantees put a CC BY license or a Creative Commons attribution license on those works. Uh, from, a, from a funder's perspective, this makes a whole lot of sense because it used to be that if I wanted to fund uh, an early childhood reading materials book project, um, I had to fund it in this country, and then I had to go fund it in that country, and then the third country, et cetera. And now they can fund it once, put an open license requirement, and the whole world can get access to it. And then with their next grant, they can fund a, an additional thing. And so we build something once, we share it everywhere. It's simply a, a radically more efficient and effective way uh, to ensure good use of public funds. 
uh, and frankly, increase access exponentially versus the way that we used to give out grants and, and contracts. Uh, two quick plugs. These are invitations for all of you. Uh, if you're interested in global open education conversations, Creative Commons, ho Creative Commons hosts something we call the Creative Commons Open Education Platform. I'll share the link to that uh, in just a minute in the chat. Uh, we work on uh, international projects on content practices and policy. So OER, open education practices, and open policies. This is free. There's no charge. Everybody's invited if you want to join us. We currently have uh, 890 people from over 70 countries around the world. So pl please do join us. We'd love to have your voice. Uh, the second uh, thing that I want to offer to all of you, we have a new program at Creative Commons called the CC Certificate. Uh, this is a 10-week online course uh, to turn your, uh, your staff, your colleagues, and you into experts in copyright, uh, open licensing, and the use of open licensing in education, uh, libraries, and other sectors of society. Uh, if you're interested in this, you can sign up today. We've got, uh, we just wrapped up one set of courses. We're running courses again in June and in September. Uh, and we're also uh, launching something that we're calling boot camps where our instructors will actually come to your country, uh, to your institutions, and uh, do a condensed version of the certificate. If that's something you'd like to do, you can find that on our website as well. And I'll share the link in the chat in just a moment. Uh, with that, let me just Say thank you to everybody again. I'm at C Green uh, on Twitter. If you want to follow me there or uh, connect with me there, I'd love to. Let me go ahead and turn off my slides. And I promise to share those two links with you. Let me do that now. So in the chat window, this first link here is for the, uh, the Creative Commons Open Education Platform. And the second link that I'm sharing here is for the Creative Commons certificate. Whoops, that didn't come out very good. Let's try it again. There we go. And uh, with that, let me uh, turn it back to my hosts. And it looks like we have some more questions, but I'll defer back to, to Limo. Yes. Thank you, uh, Kebo, for a wonderful presentation and for responding to the questions in detail. Uh, I think we have more questions before we come to an end of this webinar. So go ahead with putting the questions. Okay, well. Oh, are they in the chat box? Yes, yes. they're in the chat box. They are already in the chat box. Okay. Uh, it looks like uh, that we we ended with uh, with Haynes' question about non-commercial. So we'll move on to Mark. Mark says uh, on Teresa's question, the host government might have copyright if your award from USAID directs disposition title uh, in the host government. Copyright should be considered a property disposition activity along with the physical assets disposition, very muddled area. So yeah, it's, it's a good point, Mark. It goes back to my original starting points, which is before you start a project, make sure that everybody's very clear who holds copyright, what's the open license requirement, and where are those materials going to be put so that there's maximum access to the public to that, to those open educational materials. Uh, who holds copyright? What, what's kind of uh, fun and exciting about open licensing is, yes, it matters who holds copyright. People care about that. It also doesn't matter a whole lot who holds copyright because if the copyright holder puts a Creative Commons attribution license on those copyrighted materials and those CC by license materials are made available to the public, the public essentially has all of the rights that the copyright holder has. Now that's not entirely true. They don't have all of the rights. They still have to record, they still have to give attribution, but they've got all the rights that we care about. They can make a copy, they can modify it, they can redistribute it, they can sell copies of it. So they can, they can do all the things that they might need to do. So yes, you wanna talk about who holds copyright. It's important, you should be clear about it, uh, but it's oftentimes, um, something that you know you can be flexible on. Some funders are more flexible about who holds copyright than others. It's something you need to engage your, your funder about. Okay, Catherine says, uh, thanks much for your presentation. 
uh, particularly last answer. Uh, this is a highly sensitive topic in Rwanda. Uh, for the Rwanda Education Board to request copyright ownership from content developers, including publishers. Yes, the government doesn't need to own copyrights when there is a better option offered with Creative Commons. They still can do whatever they want to do with openly licensed contract, content. Yes, that's true. Uh, we plan a series of meetings to better understand OER with key education stakeholders in Rwanda. That's great. Um, and, you know, feel free, if it's ever useful, to pull me or we can bring somebody else from Creative Commons virtually into those meetings if that's helpful. Uh, sometimes um, it's helpful to have somebody from outside from Creative Commons come in in a very, um, you know, even-handed, factual way and to answer the legal questions that a government or the government's lawyers might have about how open licensing works with copyright. And if that's ever useful, feel free to reach out to me anytime. And I'm happy to help if I'm the right person. If what you need is a lawyer, I can have our general counsel come or one of our other attorneys and answer questions. So feel free to use us if that's helpful. Um, looks like some, I can't see the full name. It starts with Kat, but uh, Kat says, thank you so much for your presentation. Oh, wait, that was the one we just read. Okay. Back to Mark. Mark's got lots of questions. He says, I have not seen a CC requirement in USAID assistance yet only in contracts. This is likely due to the different regulations related to intangible property rights for acquisition versus assistance. So Mark, really important point. Um, and this is a, and I'm speaking now to USAID and all other funders. It is um, really important when you adopt an open license requirement to go out of your way as a funder to be clear about what those requirements are. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, usually when we work with funders, uh, we help them with the language to make sure the language is clear and accurate. Um, uh, because just to be honest, funders tend not to be experts in either copyright uh, or in open licensing, and that's okay. Uh, that's something that Creative Commons uh, helps with, and we're happy to do so. Um, so you want to put it on your website under the policy section. You want it in the contracts. Uh, if you have a webinar in advance to answer questions about a grant program, you want a slide up that says, there is a CC BY requirement on these materials. Here's what that means. Here's where you're going to put the materials. Here's who will hold copyright to the materials produced under grant funds. So it's, it's really important to go out of your way so that, to Mark's point, there isn't confusion down the road. Because when there's confusion, you get non-compliance. Uh, when there's confusion, sometimes people look for loopholes where they don't have to comply, and you want to eliminate that confusion. It's only it's only a fair thing to do. Um, that can be a lot of work. It tends to um, get easier as you go along because your grantees learn that you have that requirement. So, for example, the Hewlett uh, Foundation has had a CC BY license requirement on all of its grants for several years now. And for the first six months, it was confusing to grantees. Now every Hewlett grantee understands that if they take a grant from the Hewlett Foundation, it has a CC BY license. And people almost don't even talk about it anymore. They just understand it because they've done it long enough. OK, uh, Catherine says, thanks. We shall uh, reach out to you in the Global Book Alliance and Global Digital Library. Awesome. Those are amazing projects. I'm big fans of both and have participated in both the GBA's open licensing conversations. And I think uh, Christopher Gunderson is on, I saw him earlier, uh, he may have dropped off uh, from the Global Digital Library as well. Uh, Mark says, remind folks they should contribute, donate to Creative Commons nonprofit, uh, and uh, we, we appreciate that. But I also want to be clear, we don't charge for the licenses. We don't, uh, if you want me to come into a meeting, there's no charge for that. Um, we, uh, we are more than happy to do this. We live and breathe to help people share and to help educate others about how to do so in an accurate and a legal way so that everyone can have access to educational materials, to the world's research, scientific data, uh, journalism, etc. So this is our passion and we're, we're very excited about it. Uh, Peter says, thanks much for the presentation. Uh, this has raised concerns from the Ministry of Education in Malawi. I've been in Malawi. It's been a while, but I was there and the Malawi Institute of Education, and there is need for further presentation on this, so it can be well understood. 
and seen as a vehicle to provision of uh, education of other than the threat to education authorities, published books. Yeah, so um, Peter, if it's useful, uh, feel free to, and I'm just going to type my email in because I don't think I had it on my slides. Commons.org. So there's my email for all of you. I'm cable at creativecommons.org. If I can be helpful, happy to happy to join a meeting, happy to do a custom presentation uh, for your government or Ministry of Education. Um, I should also say that we, uh, we work with UNESCO, and your ministers of education are involved, in, all of your ministers of education are involved in a conversation at UNESCO right now uh, on a proposal called the OER, or Open Educational Resources Recommendation. Uh, this has been in the works now for several years. Um, UNESCO has been a longtime leader in open educational resources. They coined the term OER way back in 2002. In 2012, uh, they passed the OER recommend. I'm sorry, the OER declaration that was unanimously passed by UNESCO member states. And there will be a vote in November of 2019 at UNESCO headquarters, where the representatives, uh, the UNESCO member states, will vote up or down for a UNESCO OER recommendation. That recommendation has a whole set of recommendations for all governments uh, about how they can support open education in their countries. And it has a request in it for governments to report out probably every two years on what they are doing to support open education in their countries. And so this, uh, this idea about sharing educational resources is happening at all levels, from grassroots all the way up to international governmental organizations like UNESCO and the United Nations, uh, and not just UNESCO, but other UN uh, agencies as well. Okay, uh, looks like Teresa says thank you. You're very welcome. And I think we got through all the questions. Hi. Thank you, Gabo, for great presentation. I now welcome Jen Fagain to provide closing remarks. Yeah, and um, wow, I wanna say thank you, Cable, for, this was so informative and to me because I've really just, in, in Global Reading Network as well, we just started uh, working with open licenses and thinking through what would be appropriate for which types of materials. And so I really appreciate this. Um, and as I say, we kind of got into this as we tried to support the Global Digital Library in getting materials from USAID missions. And it just became really clear right away that um, we needed to uh, offer some more information to the public. So I'm really glad that you connected with us. I'm glad there, that you have your own community uh, of affiliates around the world that our colleagues can connect with um, to get support. And, and, and I'm also excited to hear about the certificate opportunity. So we'll be sure to share that with everyone. Um, for our colleagues that joined online, um, I just wanted to say I know uh, many people sent questions in advance. And we'll just pass them by cable so that he can put together some quick answers to them and um, send them back to the participants. It may take us a little bit to get that done, but be sure that we will get them back to you. We will also, we've recorded the webinar. Um, we have to obviously sort of clean it up and make sure it sounds good, but we will share that with you as well. You might want to um, you know, encourage your Ministry of Education colleagues if they were not able to join you today to listen to the webinar. I think we usually upload it to, to YouTube, so it's very accessible. Um, and the third thing is that, or I don't know, the third thing I think is, is that um, we, um, we would like to encourage any missions, um, if you have any publishers that you've been working with that are trying out a business model focused on open licensing, they're making some adjustments in their business practices, please do contact us because we would love to include them in the upcoming webinar. And, um, and that would be it. So uh, anyway, thanks again, Cable, for joining us. Really excited that we got this started. And um, thanks everyone else for joining us today. Uh, another note uh, for our colleagues, at, particularly at missions or other implementers, et cetera, who've joined us is that uh, Cable is going to repeat this webinar on April 24th at 10 p.m. to allow colleagues from Central Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia to join. So please spread the word. Um, if you enjoyed this presentation, please let them know that, uh, or please forward the invitation we sent to you to colleagues in that region. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody, and I want to say have a great day.